say a couple of things before giving my decision, and I, I think it worth noting. And I think it's important. The court was listening very carefully, and I guess my mom raised me a little bit different, but I'll just refer to them as Denise, Elizabeth, and Mary. And it's, um, as I listened to their testimony about what they went through, um, let me first of all say that I don't think for one moment that they were exaggerating, trying to make something that was horrible seem worse. I listened very closely when they couldn't answer something specifically. They said so, but they were very specific about what they went through. Um, I've been doing this for 23, 24 years. And um, I'm always impressed, certainly, by witnesses. Um, their stories were hard to hear, certainly. But it had to be difficult for them to tell. And I don't, certainly can't think of any more credible testimony that this court has heard and any more courageous testimony. Um, particularly, I one of the, the things that was remarkable about their testimony, particularly with regard to Denise and Elizabeth, and you'll excuse me for using their first names, but um, Everything they did and what they put up with at some point was really for the protection of their children. They were almost willing to sacrifice themselves for that. It was not a hard stretch for this court to figure out why did he stay, particularly after the point in time that Elisa was born. She stayed. A lot of ways to try to protect Elise. She dealt with him because I think in her mind, and I think in terms of what she was saying, there was a great fear that he was going to do something. But if I keep in contact, if I appease him in some way, my child will be okay. Ms. Reese had the same thought process. And I don't, you know, sometimes when you're up here hearing these cases, you, your mind can't sort of hold it all, but you leave certain things behind. But um, the testimony of Ms. Reese when she was talking about being in that speeding car. Not knowing what it was going to happen, what was going to happen, hoping and praying that the door was going to open so she could extricate herself from that vehicle while it was moving. She knew she had to get out. And I won't forget her words. It's almost as if she wasn't really trying to save herself. But she was trying to send a message to her daughters that um, I had to let them know I tried to do something. And after going through all of that, Mr. Williams, I don't know that he deserves that title, uh, ends up hitting her in the head with a two by four as she's trying to get away. I start with their testimony because I, quite frankly, um, I realize this is a probable cause hearing. 
This case goes way beyond probable cause in what's just shown to me here today. And I don't I know for sure I haven't seen it all. Um, but <sighs> a lot of cases I've seen. And I'll be honest with you, I've not seen a monster like this ever. And what he did to people. I take to heart what defense counsel is arguing that, yes, he's abusive to women. He's does this, but that he isn't necessarily abusive to children or whatever. Listening to this case as it was going on, I thought about that. And at the very beginning, that the things that Denise was describing and then ultimately Elizabeth were describing the initial part of Miss Reese's testimony. I'm because he does all of these bad things, does that make him a murderer? Nothing at that point in the testimony had shown that he had necessarily done anything to a child. Okay, you hear the testimony of Elizabeth, about Elizabeth, or about Kimberly, excuse me, and what happened to her. And while I was trying to keep the date straight, and freely admit this, I had one question for the prosecutor because it didn't come up during the course of the testimony. But the end of questioning Cerise, um, she looked back regarding testimony and I, Detective Iverson knew and he knew that one thing had not come out and that was the age of the child. And then the question was asked, and I will be honest with you, I thought in my mind, maybe she's six, seven, maybe she's somewhere. She's two and a half. <laughs> and in somebody's care with broken bones. And that happens while that child, and he doesn't take the child to the hospital. He doesn't, he, he does nothing. Not until Elizabeth got there, thank God. Child receives medical. I have a whole lot of feelings about the case, but not feelings that cloud my judgment as to whether or not probable cause has been established. I think probable cause regarding the charge of open murder has been clearly established by the people. And just in terms of certain facts, You're right, he couldn't have Denise, he couldn't control Denise. So what does he do? He finds her, pushes her down, and takes the one thing that she knows, he knows is very precious to her, and he takes Alyssa. April 29th, 1982, took her. And that was a mom that never saw her daughter again. Because in this court's mind, and based upon the evidence, that poor little baby didn't make it to September of that year. Others who were mothers who came into contact with the child, Elizabeth, and they were trying to get him to go away because their intent was to try to get that baby back to his mother, her mother. It didn't work out. He left with the baby. As there are these others looking to get back, others are beginning to ask questions about this baby. They see this baby. They see the baby at the hospital. They see the baby at the home. And they know, and he's giving a story about where Denise is that doesn't make any sense, doesn't fit in with where Denise actually was. And he's just making up stories, lying about why he has the baby. 
regrettably, we knew that it was going to have a tragic outcome because as evidenced by his care of Kimberly, he doesn't have the patience to be able to deal with the child. Kimberly at two and a half ends up with broken bones because she's crying. Can imagine what he must have thought of poor Lisa. And then his unexplained trip. And I recall the, the testimony very clearly because he didn't have bags, he didn't have anything. He just said he had to go to Alabama. He just left. He had to go. And he took off. No baby that he had been sort of carting around, carrying around. He also then ultimately ends up back here and people begin to question him. And again, he can't keep his lie straight. And he, as his children testified to, his children that he had with Elizabeth testified to, he, when they ask, he just says, he gets agitated when they asked about Alyssa. He gets agitated and says he can't remember. Ask about the abuse, he can't remember. All of those horrible things he did, he just can't remember. But yeah, that wasn't good enough. The prosecutor's right, because at some point, he wants to stop being asked about it. So he feigns these various stories of implants in his chips in his head and um, some loss of memory from a car accident, which are not borne out by any medical records, visits to places in Alabama to deal with that that frankly don't exist for the purposes of medical treatment. Um, and all of those things, he just keeps saying them. Then as I listen to Detective Iverson, when they start to get close to him, and he's no longer really, I think, beginning to fool people because now I'm dealing with police. And sometimes I don't want to talk to you. Sometimes I don't want to do this. He decides his best bet and his way of sort of, sort of putting it into the questioning is to just say, not only does he not know Alyssa, what happened to her, but he doesn't know his wife, his former wife. He doesn't know any of these people. And he thinks that's going to do it for him. Um, just regrettably for him, or at least as it sit here, sits here today, uh, that didn't do it for him. Um, certainly, I could go through rely upon all the testimony that the court heard. I could go through all of the issues that the prosecutor has gone through regarding the consciousness of guilt. That is overwhelming here in terms of what he did, his stories. He can't even keep consistent, as the prosecutor indicated, to one story. He's making it up. It's like he's throwing these things up against the wall to see what sticks, what people will buy. Um, and that's what he was doing. The last person that he was with, that little baby Alyssa was with, was the defendant, who at, through right, for right or for wrong reasons, was in charge of her care. Um, and then nobody sees Alyssa at some point. He then, outside of the consciousness of guilt of all of his lies and everything, he confesses. It is no doubt in my mind that his statements about the killing of a baby or having killed a woman and a child, having killed a baby and no, can't find them, is his confession. And so for those reasons, I, I, and I just want to make it also very clear that I don't you look at this certainly on a probable cause standard. Um, and as I've said, I think the evidence is well beyond that of probable cause. 
that the defendant um, committed the offense of homicide against baby Alyssa um, and that he did so in the year of 1982. So for those reasons, the court would find that the people have indeed sustained their burden of proof in this case. I would find the defendant over to stay in trial on the offense of open murder. Thank you.